There are two ways, really, how you can view and review the Rodecaster Duo podcasting and streaming mixer. One is to say that it is a Rodecaster Pro 2 with two inputs instead of four for $150 or $200 less, which would be totally true. Apart from the two less physical combo inputs and headphone ports, two less faders and two less smart pads, it does everything that the Rodecaster Pro 2 does. So if you don't ever use four mic inputs and four headphone ports, it's your device. End of the video. That's it. You still have every feature of the Rodecaster Pro 2, which makes it stand out on the market of podcasting and streaming consoles. Auto-muting speakers, Bluetooth input and output even to Bluetooth speakers, Wi-Fi connection, wireless mic receiver on any of the mic inputs, software integration with Rode Central to transfer recordings or set up the device, smart pads with advanced functions like fully customizable talkback, ducking, voice effects and MIDI controls, as well as a built-in digital signal processing that includes high-pass filter, noise gate, de-esser, compressor, three-band parametric EQ, Aphex Big Bottom and Oral Exciter, even panning, and the master compeller on the main output. You also have the same power for routing and submixes, through which you have total and absolute control over what audio goes out from the console, and of course the assignable faders, which is even more handy on the Duo than on the bigger RCP2, as you have to make do with four physical faders. You can decide to put your mic on the first fader, the Discord chat on the second, game sounds on the third, and smart pets on the fourth, or any other way you prefer. The Pro 2 and the Duo even have the same firmware, so everything you would have software-wise on the RCP2, you also have here on the Duo, it just controls a smaller hardware. And that would be one way to look at the Rodecaster Duo. The other way to look at it is to look a bit more closely and try to understand where this product is going to be in 6 to 12 months from now. Because there are some subtle differences versus the Rodecaster Pro 2, positive and negative, that are somewhat strangely implemented as of the current state of things. Knowing Rode's firmware update history, however, lets me assume that at the end of the day, this device, while it may cater for a slightly different group of creators, in the not very distant future will be totally different and it might just become the best device Rode has ever crafted so far. And I will also tell you how you can get your hands on this sick looking white version of it, so make sure to stick around for that. So the quick takeaway from the first review approach that compares it to the Rodecaster Pro 2 is that in the back it has two analog combo inputs versus four on the Rodecaster Pro 2. For some reason they are <laughs> upside down, can't possibly fathom why, but it is so. It consequently also has two headphone ports on the backside versus four on the Rodecaster Pro 2. It has six sound pads versus eight on the Rodecaster Pro 2, actually six times eight, as you have the same eight smart pad banks, so you have there 48 pads instead of 64 on the RCP2 in total. Both are enough, so no worries there. And since the smart pad names are still rather small and shifted towards the middle, as they are on the screen, and are therefore not easy to relate to the actual buttons that say on the Mixcast 4 it is an easier thing to do because they are right below the screen. It is actually an advantage that you only have to build six pads into the muscle memory, or as Hang from Free Podcast Tools has hilariously pointed out, instead of an 8 to 1 chance, now you have a 33% better chance, 6 to 1, to actually hit the right smart pad. Not sure I got the probability calculations right, but you get the point. And when it comes to the faders, it has four instead of six. Also sacrifice on the hardware side is that you don't have the physical record button anymore, which fell on the size battlefield, I'm afraid. There's simply no room for it anymore. Here you have to use the on-screen record button instead, which, as it turns out, after four months of use, is quite an annoying experience, at least compared to being able to push a physical button. Because what works well on a physical button for pausing and stopping recording is noticeably less pleasant to do on screen. You are covering the button with your finger while you are pressing and holding it so you don't see as it changes its color. You kind of hope you've pressed it long enough to stop it. I would actually prefer if the entire frame of the screen would turn red, yellow or green to make it more obvious. By the way, its colors are slightly different too. Gone is the blue color that indicated that you don't have a storage medium inserted and consequently cannot start recording internally. It is now a boring grey record button. Boring, but more telling, arguably. The second issue I have with the record button being moved to the screen 
is that because of this, you now don't have the icon of the show you are running on screen, which I also really miss. Not only as it was a quick shortcut to the recordings on the SD card, but also to simply indicate which show you have loaded. If you are doing multiple ones with different fader and mic setups, it is very handy to see at a glance where you are. On the Duo, you just don't see it. And to get to the recordings, you need to navigate through the menu, which is one more click. Not a massive difference, but a difference nonetheless. Having said all this, aside from the record button that is just not there, all the buttons, knobs, pads and dials are the same size as they are on the RCP2, so at first look, it is just as easy and convenient to operate, even if it has less inputs and less sound pads to deal with, and the faders are a little bit shorter, which is totally okay. But what if I told you that it is not a 2 input device, but actually a 4 input device? That immediately sounds much better for the price, right? It is a 4 input device first because of the 1.3.2 firmware update that we'll discuss in a minute and because you have an extra port there that is not there on the big brother, the RCP2, a front-facing TRRS port. Now unfortunately this port is not a TRRS port that you can plug a smartphone into. It is purely meant for headphones and headsets like the NTH100M. There's no way around it, you cannot switch it over to the line input, which would be needed for a phone. It is what it is, accept it, it's not a phone input. On the other hand, you can use it as a more convenient headphone port that is pointing towards you, and you can also use any other mic with this port that has a 3.5mm connection using a TRS to TRS cable. And that would mean most camera microphones along the lines of the Rode Video Mic Go 2 or DD's equivalent products which immediately makes it a 3 mic input device. Well, sort of. Because there are three strange things with this that disturb me a little bit. Quite a bit, actually. You see, you can even assign its own input channel for this TRRS port, which of course only makes sense if you are using it as a headset with a microphone and not just an extra phone facing output port for a headphone. You even have a dedicated output channel for it in the multitrack USB output, which is the last one, number 15, should you ever want to set it up in a DAW, and it's a mono channel by the way, just like the mic inputs. You can also assign it to a physical fader, but strangely, and unfortunately, while we can do all this with this port as an input, we can't say the same about the output that's coming out of this TRS port. It just does not have its own dedicated output, but it is shared with the headphone one output instead. So you may have the third separate microphone input, but you will still only have two distinct headphone outputs, as the headset will hear the same as the headphone one, and it is even controlled with the headphone one's dial. And this is a half success, I'd say, if it would have its dedicated output, it would be much more versatile as you could at least go into the routing menu and create a separate headphone output mix for it. But of course it's harder to control it this way as you still wouldn't have its own physical headphone dial. Or do you? Because the second strange thing here is that the headphone dials have also changed compared to the Rodecaster Pro 2. Here on the Duo they are endless relotatable step dials and have no marking on them for the level. Instead, the halo LED ring around them indicates the current level, much like on the Streamer X 4K. I don't necessarily like it, as they are not very well readable unless you are in a pitch dark environment, but it can just be the right choice because also these dials are now clickable. And it has no point whatsoever why they are clickable, as clicking them does not do anything, at least for now. But it could very well be able to switch between regulating the headphone one output and the headset's output, just like it changes the mic inputs on the Streamer X, which in turn would also enable the headsets to have its own separate output channel. I cannot really imagine any other use case for clicking the headphone dial, but Rode's developer team surely can, so I'm looking forward to what it will do at the end. The third strange thing is that even if you have a dedicated input for the headset that is plugged into the TRRS port, the total possible maximum number of faders remains the same. It's 7 versus 9 on the Rodecaster Pro 2. And this is a bit unfortunate, as if you do select the headphone input for a channel, then you won't be able to assign a fader to one of the other available channels, because, let's count it together, with the headset input, you'd have 8 possible input channels, but only 7 possible fader assignments, 4 physical and 3 virtual, as you can see on the main screen as well. There's no way to add more. 
So if you happen to use all possible inputs, then you need to sacrifice the control of either one of the mic channels or the Bluetooth or the smart pads or the USB 1 or the USB 1 chat or the USB 2. One of them will simply not have a fader, neither physical nor virtual. Now this is not a problem on the Rodecaster Pro 2 as there you have six physical faders and three virtual faders, so all the nine possible inputs may be assigned to a fader. Now this is probably an edge case, which will not happen too often, but this is just not the usual clean road implementation that we were accustomed to. The screen real estate is there, so there's no physical barrier. I suspect it's more due to software development workload distribution reasons. It is easier to keep the RCP2 and Duo on the same software, with both having three virtual faders and not adding a fourth one to the Duo to accommodate all potential inputs. Still again, it's unfortunate. What is fortunate, on the other hand, is that due to the same firmware, the Duo is also about to receive firmware 1.3.2. The killer new feature in it is the USB microphone compatibility. With this, you are able to connect and use most recent Rode USB mics to the Rodecaster Duo and Pro 2 as well. It is, however, way more important for the Duo, though, as that is the fourth mic input that you can directly plug into the console and record it onto its own separate track. So with that, and counting in the TRRS port for a headset mic, the Duo immediately becomes a Quattro. More details in my previous video, I'll link it up there. As for the overall conclusion, to me the Rodecaster Duo is an unfinished business. There's quite a few improvements to be expected on it, be it for the clickable headphone dials, to increasing font size for the smart pads, and adding another virtual fader to cater for all possible inputs, to bringing back the show icon to the main screen, Yet it is even today just as powerful as the Rodecaster Pro 2 in a much smaller form factor for everyone who do not need 4 analog mic inputs and 9 channels, and it costs tangibly less, which will probably make it the best selling interface for Rode, like ever. Especially as it is now also available in white version, along with the original pod mic, the PSA OnePlus boom arm, and the NTH100 headset. So if you want your studio table to look like a panda bear sanctuary, or a Stormtrooper base camp, I have the links in the description where you can purchase them from. On a final note, I can't leave it out, that the Roadcaster Duo is just simply adorable on the studio table. They should have called it the Roadcaster Baby, in all honesty. But even if it is this cute, I'm very much looking forward to future firmware updates that A, make use of the clickable headphone dials, and B, address the current limitations, even at the cost of maybe separating the firmwares of the Duo and the Roadcaster Pro 2. And with that, thanks for watching. And bye for now.